Welcome to science class. Today we will be learning about the key ways in which living organisms interact with one another. In the previous video, I talked about how at some level, most organisms are connected to most other organisms in their immediate environment. Many of those interactions are indirect and cannot be directly observed, but we understand plenty of species to species interactions that do occur directly. That is what we will be discussing today. Let's get started. Species interactions generally only happen at the level of the ecosystem. It's true that human activity impacts environments where humans don't live. Photosynthesis in the oceans produces most of the oxygen in the atmosphere breathed by all life on land and more. But those things really aren't in our purview. Local species interactions are examples of what we call symbiosis, which are long-term biological interactions between organisms of different species. This means that predation is not a type of symbiosis, because there's nothing long-term about being eaten by a lion. Yes, the population of lions interacts long-term with the population of antelopes, but symbiotic relationships are one individual to another, not one group to another. When two species interact with each other, there are three possible outcomes for each species. They are either helped, harmed, or there is virtually no effect. This means there are six possible species A to species B interactions. Let's go over those. Mutualism is when both species benefit from their interaction. It may be the case that one species receives a greater benefit than the other, but if both are helped, then it is mutualistic. Some examples. Many herbivorous animals have specialized microbes that live in their gut that help them digest plant matter. Raw vegetation is hard to digest on account of the high amount of cellulose present in it. You've probably heard that fiber is an essential part of your diet. Fiber is defined as the portion of plant-derived food that can't be digested by human enzymes. Wait, we need to consume things that we can't digest? While you cannot digest fiber, the gut microbes in you can, and you receive digestive health benefits from it. It makes it easier for you to poop. There, I said it. Coral reefs are made by polyps, which are tiny gelatinous animals similar to anemones. There's photosynthetic algae that lives inside the tissue of the polyp. The algae produces excess amounts of food and other organic products that the polyp uses, and the algae receive a habitat. However, algae can live independently of the polyps. This is known as a facultative relationship, where one species is capable of existing independent of the other. Other types of mutualism are obligate, in which both species cannot exist without the other. Popular examples of mutualism between animals include clownfish and anemones, and cleaning rafts and the larger fish whose parasites they eat. Animals and plants have many mutualistic benefits. Some species make their homes inside of trees, but don't provide any benefit to the tree. But many types of ants will attack any organism that gets close to the tree they live in, a mutualistic benefit. Fruit is grown by plants that, in turn, gets eaten by animals, causing its seeds to be distributed more widely than it otherwise would, and poop makes great fertilizer. Some of this mutualism is highly specialized. For example, birds do not have the ability to taste spicy food. The heat, caused by an oil called capsaicin, that averts other animals from peppers simply isn't noticed by birds. This allows birds and peppers to be the only ones capable of having that mutualistic relationship. Mycorrhizal fungi attach themselves to, or even make their way inside, of tree roots. This insanely complicated network of fungi helps extract water, minerals, and nutrients into the ground, which the trees also receive. But we are learning that nutrients, as well as communicative chemicals, can be passed from one tree to another through the fungi tracts. When one tree is attacked by a type of insect, the neighboring trees begin preemptively secreting a toxic chemical that prevents them from being more severely affected by the insects. While it is often described as mutualism, pollinating insects and flowers do not have a true mutualistic relationship. This is because pollination is not a long-term interaction. Pollination is a discrete event. The bee comes in and then goes. There are countless other examples of mutualism, but we will move on to commensalism next. 
Commensalism is a relationship where one species benefits, while the other is generally not affected. As stated before, many organisms make their homes inside of trees, which does not harm the tree, but the tree receives virtually no benefit either. There are many types of fish that swim near much larger fish or whales for protection or to reduce the effort to swim, but the larger fish receives nothing in return. Barnacles can be harmful, but in most cases are not. Spiders weave their webs between plants, which are not helped or harmed by that. Some spiders make their habitat inside of pitcher plants, which are plants that have deep pitcher-shaped leaves that hold water. Pitcher plants are carnivorous and have evolved mechanisms for attracting and trapping prey. The spiders will take some of the prey and can also hide from their own predators. This is a slight detriment to the pitcher plant, but I don't think it quite rises to the level of parasitism, which we will get to later. Similarly, Mosquitoes suck blood, which doesn't truly harm the other species. Now it's true that mosquitoes pass on malaria, dengue, and other diseases, but the mosquito doesn't cause them. Malaria is caused by a single-celled organism known as plasmodium, while dengue is a virus. Mosquitoes are what you call a vector host, an organism that transmits an infectious agent to a host. Fact is, mosquitoes don't want to transmit disease. It doesn't help them. And if a thousand mosquitoes bit you and didn't transmit any disease, your only symptom would be itchiness. Vampire bats, similarly, are commensal organisms in that they do not truly cause harm to the other organism. In order to pass the commensalism test, a symbiotic relationship almost has to be facultative, as described previously, where one species can do without the other. There are seemingly endless examples of mimicry in the plant and animal kingdom. Mimicry can be an example of either mutualism or commensalism, although the case for commensalism is a bit weak. One form of mimicry is known as Müllerian mimicry, named after Fritz Müller, who proposed the idea and formulated a mathematical model to prove the idea's validity. Yes, even in biology, ideas are often tested and proven using math. Mimicry is any sort of practice where one species copies the appearance or behavior of another species which shares its habitat. In the case of Müllerian mimicry, which was observed in multiple species of butterfly, one species mimics the physical appearance of a foul-tasting species. One species naturally evolved a distinct pattern that says to predators, don't eat me, I taste awful, and another has mimicked it. What Müller proposed, and his model supports, is that this can indeed benefit both species. Although one species appears to be freeloading, stealing intellectual property rights of the other, the fact is that there are more butterflies with this unique pattern, which means there are more signaling patterns in the environment for predators to learn from. Now it's true that the mimics don't taste bad, but their pattern works as reinforcement to predators who have eaten the foul-tasting butterflies in the past. As you increase reinforcement, you change the behavior of the predator. These butterflies are basically doing psychology experiments. Another type of mimicry is known as Batesian mimicry, named after Henry Walter Bates, who also pioneered his work by studying butterflies in the Amazon rainforest. Batesian mimicry is when one species mimics the warning signals of a harmful species. One that many kids learn is how the king snake and coral snake look very similar. I remember distinctly the rhyme I learned to tell the difference. Red touch yellow, kill a fellow. Red touch black, venom lack. I've never seen either of these snakes and probably never will, but it was a lesson learned nonetheless. There are flies that mimic almost perfectly the appearance of bees and hornets, caterpillars that look stunningly like snakes, and countless others. Batesian mimicry is closer to commensalism. The species that is being imitated is not the beneficiary of anything, but it isn't harmed either. It's not a solid case for commensalism, however, because the mimicking species and the one being copied don't typically have a direct interaction. In some cases, it could be argued that Batesian mimicry is parasitic. Some animals mimic other species in order to invade their home and take from them. Speaking of parasitism, that's what we are going to discuss next. A parasitic interaction is one where one species benefits at the expense of the host. There's an enormous range of different parasites that are out there. We have discussed the fungal parasite that causes potato blight before. There are parasitic plants as well. Many of them do not have real roots and are not even connected to the soil. These parasitic plants have special structures that penetrate the host plant, connecting them to the conducting tissue of the plant. Conducting tissue is like the circulatory system of the plant. It's where the water and nutrients are circulated. 
So these parasitic plants, which include plants such as mistletoe, the corpse lily, which is the largest flowering plant in the world, and snow plants, oftentimes don't even undergo photosynthesis. Or if they do, it's for a limited time. There are other plants called epiphytes, which grow on other plants but are not parasitic because they undergo photosynthesis and capture resources from the environment, just not the soil. But the real interesting and horrible parasites exist in the animal kingdom. Being a parasite is an extremely successful adaptation for an animal. Around 40% of all animal species are parasites. And because most are microscopic, in terms of sheer number of individuals, parasites might outnumber non-parasites by orders of magnitude. Parasites are specifically adapted to take advantage of their host. For example, tapeworms have recurved hooks on their heads that anchor them in place within their host's gut. There are some parasites, such as toxoplasma and some types of flatworm, that directly alter the behavior of their host. In mice, toxoplasma makes them sexually attracted to the scent of cat urine, which greatly increases the chances that the mice will be eaten by a cat. The life cycle of toxoplasma gondii can only be completed inside of a cat's gut, and altering the behavior of mice is how it ensures that's where it ends up. I highly encourage you to check out zombie parasites on your own to see what that's all about. There are types of wasps that temporarily paralyze a caterpillar and lay their eggs inside of it. Then, over time, the larvae hatch and eat their way out of the still living caterpillar. While that example, and many more, are horrifying and lead to the death of the host, other parasitic relationships aren't as bad. For example, there are what are known as brood parasites. The cuckoo will lay its egg inside of the nest of another host species of bird. The cuckoo egg will hatch before the other eggs in the nest. The baby cuckoo, before it can even see, will then kick the other eggs out of the nest, making it so the parents are only taking care of this one baby bird. What's really bizarre is the baby cuckoo is typically way more massive than the parents that are taking care of it. For some reason, the parents don't understand that this isn't my baby, and they raise the cuckoo all the way to adulthood. In that case, the baby birds are killed, which is quite harmful, but the parents who are being taken advantage of are not necessarily directly harmed in any way by this. However, the parent cuckoo who lays the egg does not have to expend energy to raise its young, and the baby cuckoo is given food and resources and a place to live. Lice are parasitic, but lice don't always directly affect the well-being of the host. I brought up a similar point about mosquitoes and vampire bats earlier, but lice do live on their hosts, unlike mosquitoes or vampire bats. Some say mosquitoes are parasitic. I say they're not because the mosquito itself doesn't directly harm the host. If it transmits a disease, it's another organism or virus that does that. But also, mosquitoes don't have long-term interactions. When a mosquito sucks your blood, that's a discrete event, just like predation or pollination. So perhaps mosquitoes and vampire bats aren't commensalists either. Luckily, hosts of parasites also have adaptations to try to keep them at bay. But evolution is an ongoing arms race where both sides keep adapting and changing, so there will always be victims. So we've seen how two species can both benefit each other, one can be benefited without the other being affected, and one being benefited while the other is harmed. That still leaves three other types of interactions, which don't require a long explanation, but here they are. If neither species is affected, that is called neutralism. Neutralistic relationships probably exist but it's virtually impossible to prove they exist. You can't prove a negative, so we'll just have to move on. When one species harms another, but receives no benefit itself, that's known as immensalism. These types of relationships are tricky, but here are some examples. Grazing animals tend to live in enormous herds. These herds are so massive that as they move around, they destroy the vegetation under their feet. The abundance of food is so large that these grazers are not affected by the fact that they stomp the vegetation out, but the vegetation clearly loses. Sometimes two species compete for the same resource. Some species of insect eat the same plants as grazers. For the grazers, the insects are just a nuisance and they could simply eat a different plant, but they don't, and instead they drive the insects away. This is at an enormous detriment to the insects, but at virtually no additional benefit to the grazers, because the insects, if left alone, would not meaningfully decrease the food availability for the grazers. And speaking of competition, that is the final kind of symbiotic relationship. In competition, both species are harmed in their interaction. 
Competition occurs between members of the same species, such as the competition for mates, but in this example, I only mean competition between different species, or interspecific competition. The niches between species can partially overlap, and in general, species compete over food, water, and habitat. The reason we say both species are harmed is because competition between them prevents their population from growing larger than it otherwise would. And any form of competition requires the expenditure of energy, which is always a loss. But yet, competition is healthy not for the two species going at each other, but for the environment itself. Competition prevents one species from dominating, which decreases biodiversity and the overall health of the ecosystem. The case study of wolves in Yellowstone is a perfect example. When the wolves were gone, competition between most other organisms became extremely lopsided rather than even, and the park suffered as a result. While the niches of species may partially overlap, two species cannot occupy the same niche. If two species try to occupy the same niche, Competition will produce a winner and a loser, and the loser will cease to exist in that environment. This is known as the competitive exclusion principle. Invasive species can also wreak havoc on the natural competitive balance that ecosystems develop over time. Over thousands of years, the species within an environment become adapted to one another in a kind of co-evolution where they can exist in a relatively stable balance. When an invasive species is introduced, there is no balance. There are many examples of invasive species that greatly decrease the biodiversity of their environment they enter. In reality, there is only one reason why species interact with each other. It's all about the business of obtaining energy. How energy flows through ecosystems will be the topic of our next video. Thanks for watching.